Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, we are speaking to Michael M. Hughes, novelist, Fortean researcher, and tarot specialist. Our discussion ranges from childhood NHE encounters to UFOs to, of course, the tarot. Michael, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here on my favorite podcast. Hooray! All right. Well, (laughs) if it's your favorite podcast, you know how we do. So, Michael, Mm -hmm. were you a weird kid? Yeah. Well, this, I mean, this this answer could really take up the whole podcast, I think. But uh, I'll I'll try to narrow it down. Yes, I I was a weird kid. Uh, But I should append a caveat to that. And that as weird as I was, I somehow managed to not be ostracized. I managed to kind of keep my weirdness going and and still, you know, be fairly happy kid, you know, well integrated. And uh, but but the, the weirdness started started very early. And some of my my earliest memories are uh, essentially light phenomena uh, of some sort in my room. As a, as a small child, I would see little balls of light floating around my room. And on a, on a couple of occasions that I distinctly remember for, for as well as, you know, you can actually remember at that age, I remember being in the hallway of my, of my house and my bedroom was at the far end of the hallway. And on the other behind me, my parents were in the living room watching TV on our little black and white television. And I would see my room become illuminated. And for whatever reason, that would cause such an intense fear that I would become essentially paralyzed and fall down and go unconscious. And it always puzzled me because I I wondered how can my parents be sitting a few feet away and watching this happen and not noticing and not saying anything about it. So that, that, that was sort of the genesis of, of the uh, Fortean sort of stuff that, that that I dealt with as a kid. But, but more so than that, I was always, um, I was always sort of grasping for magic in my life. even, Even at that age, I was really intrigued by altered states of consciousness, and I would do these sort of experiments on my, my, my poor unwitting friends. I would set up a, a little, you know, almost a little mini MK Ultra setup in my basement with, a, with an office chair that I could, I could move around, and I'd, I'd set my two stereo speakers on either side of the chair, and I'd get my strobe light and plug that in. And I would have my friends sit in this um, blindfolded in this chair and I would play, you know, weird music, Pink Floyd or whatever. I think I had a a Genesis album that had audio of the uh, of the moon landing. So my poor friends would be sitting sitting in this chair while I'm blasting music and a strobe light in their in their blindfolded face. Uh, and and moving the chair around as if they're flying through space and and things like that. So, so that I, I, they they definitely considered that a, a little on the weird side. So it's safe to say none of your childhood friends had epilepsy then. <laughs> no, uh, hopefully not. Um, they they seem to survive relatively intact. At, at the same time, this was the '70s, you know, and I was. Everything was immersed in the weird and the paranormal. My father read a lot of books. He read you know, Frank Edwards' UFO books. He read Hans Holzer about ghosts and reincarnation and witchcraft and, and all that sort of stuff. So I would pick up his books, and I just just tore through these things. So my head was always in that space, and we watched In Search Of together. Uh, one, of, one of my father's friends screened chariots of the gods in his living room at, at one point <laughs> and invited some people over to watch that so i, I was th- this was this was the world i knew i was just i was just Im- completely immersed in this stuff and then i think that the, the the very first real demonstration of 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 pure magic that i experienced was with pyramid power and there was a uh, there was a guy that lived near my house 
who sold pyramids and pyramid books out of his garage. And one what day, what was I, it about the seventies? Honestly, <laughs> I mean, it, the the decade makes no sense in retrospect. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But I'm so very happy that I was caught in that 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 ins- insanity of that decade. So I, I I got my dad convinced him to take me to to this pyramid seller, and uh, and bought a couple pyramids, bought a book on pyramid power. And I decided to do some experiments. So I made my own pyramid to the dimensions of the Great Pyramid and and all that, used my protractor and, 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 and cut out the sides of it. So it was really just sort of the frame. And I did some experiments. I, I put fruit under the pyramid and I sat a piece of fruit outside of it. And the fruit under the pyramid just kind of shriveled up. And the piece outside got green and moldy. And I did. I used a piece of bacon. The bacon inside the pyramid just kind of hardened and dried up, and the piece outside got slimy and moldy. And I think the most convincing one was I, I put a, a cup of milk underneath the pyramid and one directly outside of it, and the the cup under the pyramid just sort of curdled. It formed a curd. It didn't stink. It had a neutral smell. And I'll never forget when I smelled the cup of milk out, that had been sitting for a couple of days outside the pyramid, I almost threw up. And to this day, my aversion to milk goes back to, goes back to that particular experiment. But so, so I, this um, this pyramid guy must have been relying on the sort of Soviet research. They were doing something very similar with large pyramids and growing stuff underneath it uh, at the time. So he must have got some of those. Uh, Soviet science journals as as a base, perhaps. Yeah, he 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 probably did. He had a, a whole array of literature, some of which he he typed up himself. And he was fond of putting cigarettes. He said it made the tobacco taste better. If you you know, I couldn't try that at the time. But I I, I so I decided to do this for my school science fair, and I won. I think it was seventh grade science fair, and my the title the title was "Do Pyramids Affect Decomposition?" And my answer was yes, they do. And so after winning in my school, I was sent to the state science fair, and what what thrills me what makes me laugh to this day is when i arrived to set up my project they 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 had a discussion for about 30 minutes of where to put me yeah. because <laughs> it was it wasn't physics it wasn't chemistry it wasn't biology you know they didn't have a metaphysics uh you know category at this at this science fair uh, so but but that was really astounding to me and to this day, it's it's really the single most it, most straightforward example of of some sort of magical technology that I've ever experienced. And it's replicable for people playing along at home who can now do that with tobacco or other things. It might be <laughs> worth uh, it might be worth having a play. That's interesting. I had a mine was boring science, but I I won a science competition for work on. Uh, which colors you pick up from your peripheral vision first because high visibility vests are in a color that is supposed to be picked up as as far back in your peripheral vision as possible for safety reasons and the color was wrong was the essentially the result of my experiment and it was run by i don't know if you know um bhp but it's a it's a very large um steel company and obviously this is australia so it's an enormous company here and we mm-hmm. were taken to this camp that included a tour of, there's a um nuclear power plant just outside sydney we're taken to a camp and and like the high point of the camp all these people who'd won these sort of state science things uh was a tour of a nuclear facility and then in, in group time they started asking weird questions like who are the two people you would invite for dinner and all that kind of stuff and i was like mm. i was like 13 and i'm like oh my god they're, they're, <laughs> they're recruiting they're recruiting for something it was very odd i think they were actually trying to see who they would um provide scholarships to i think they were looking for like new people to do science and i, I kind of it freaked mm. me out i don't think it was anything more dodgy than um big business capitalism but it freaked me out so i ended up <laughs> like in the rocketry experiments strapping a rubber chicken to my bottle rocket and i uh, <laughs> never got invited anywhere afterwards <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't uh, know who would be paying attention at a state fair when it's like this kid has something to do with pyramids. Um, I don't know. Maybe you got your father on a on a Cold War watch list. 
<laughs> Probably. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. All the subversive stuff we were reading. Um, absolutely. So going back yeah, to it, the, um, just to interrupt mm-hmm. because I, before we mm-hmm, um, lose sure. the thread, but going back to mm-hmm. the uh, hallway incident, do you think that is a screen memory, like with the benefit of age, or do you think that is a dream experience that's been kind of moved around your mind a bit with the, you know, with the benefit of years, if you will. Yeah, it, it seems it, it, again, I always have to qualify. I was young when, when, when this happened, but it seems extremely vivid. And throughout my entire childhood, I, I, I've, I've really felt like this was a, this was very much a real experience in the, the, the couple of times, you know, falling unconscious on the ground um, and, and one night I actually woke up in the basement unconscious and, you know, for a, for a kid, that's terrifying. That's yeah. the most, that's terrifying for an adult. Basements are scary. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it feels very real to me. And I've, you know, through the years I've talked to people, I talked to Bud Hopkins and he tried to get me to come up, um, to, to visit him in New York to, to undergo regression and things like that. And it definitely fits the, the model of, you know, quote unquote, ab- abduction phenomenon. But it, uh, I, I've never wanted to go there because mm. I, 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 first of all, I know too much that I feel like I, I, I could confabulate if, if, if I were hypnotized. So I, it, yeah, I just kind of, I, I kind of left it in a mystery bucket, but there, there were, you know, there are other oddities. It, it's another, I was a little bit older and I had suddenly developed this compulsion to check inside. Um, whenever I go in the bathroom, I would look in the hamper, you know, or look behind the shower curtain. And it just came out of nowhere. It was just I, and I didn't even understand why I was doing it. I just felt like something could be hiding in there. And so the, the, you know, there's a lot of. I, I, I mean, I had a, a, a really profound sighting uh, experience later in my life, um, in, in 1990. So there's a whole lot of there's a whole lot of indicators that it, when I talk to you know a mainstream ufologist, they would say, "Oh, well, clearly, yeah, clearly that's, you have that's why you don't history. that's why you don't want to talk to them." There's a kind of <laughs> exactly. a, a range of experiences there. I mean, when you said that there was a kind of fear emanation from the bedroom, I mean, on a scale of one to ten, was that like terror, or was that I'm a bit scared of going to oh yeah it, it, it was terror to, yeah. to the point to the point where i would i would fall down I, I literally collapse from fear paralysis and go unconscious for for i don't know how long i mean that was that was the creepy thing was waking up from these experiences too and and knowing not knowing how long i'd been like that and also n- thinking why didn't my, you know why are my parents still sitting there you know why why their their kid just fell in his face. Have you spoken hallway. to them about the hallway one? I talked to my mother. She doesn't remember it. Um, she remembers lots of other odd things um, from my ch- from my weird childhood, but she doesn't remember that. Because the fear and the paralysis. I mean, I have similar experiences from my own childhood. They're more in. They're kind of like a variant of hag attacks because this, the same mm-hmm. sort of thing happens. And it, I mean, mm-hmm. the necessary but insufficient physical explanation is that you had a combination of sleepwalking and sleep paralysis, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. the sleep paralysis comes with the, the terror and the falling down right. and the sleepwalking comes with sleepwalking. Uh, mm-hmm. But as you, I mean, my experience, I actually just completed an interview about this yesterday. My experience, uh, it's one of those... Uh, Like, I know what I saw, um, certainties that the, the common hag experience explanation is insufficient because that was Mm -hmm. a, that was a real entity experience. It does present Mm -hmm. with the kind of, um, different parts of your brain waking up kind of thing, but it was a real thing at the same time. And it just, it's interesting to me that children have that, like I would rather than uh, nothing necessarily against, um, Bud Hopkins, but um, mm-hmm. you, you kind of, it looks to me like a two third overlap with, it's closer to hag attacks, if you will, mm-hmm. um, which, mm-hmm. which sort of opens up the interpretation. But I, I, that, that's very interesting to me that it's the same kind of terror and paralysis and entity contact and bits that I'm not sure uh, if they're screen memories for something or not, because my paralysis night terrors would either be mm-hmm. a classic hag attack or they'd be things that are patently screen memories. So mm-hmm, I would mm-hmm. I would 
perceived that I would be shrinking into the actual um, uh, sort of weave of the bed so that it was constricting. Like they, they, they became as large as mm. sort of ship ropes. And then there's mm. memories of needles and also mm. a memory of, um, well, it was a, a human. I don't know if you remember He Man, but He Man had a. Oh, yeah. He Man had a. Um, one of his allies was, I think it was called Buzz Off, but it was essentially a human bee man. And I, the, he was in there with my mother's head. And also they were like inside the weave. And this is the screen memory bit was a Romulan warbird. So there are actual spaceships, <laughs> but they were uh-huh. ones that uh, I've. Yeah. That's what my mind came up with for what was going sure. on there. And that, so it's interesting to have that range that goes from paralysis, negative entity encounter to. Mm-hmm things that with the benefit of being a bit older and a little bit more learned on the matter, you go, ah, oh, something went on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My, uh, I, I have, I've had a few sleep paralysis, old hag experiences, but there was one in 1996. I was at a bed and breakfast and, uh, it was a snow, huge snowstorm in West Virginia. I was staying at a B and B with my girlfriend and, I had the classic old hag sleep paralysis experience where I woke up, could could move nothing but my eyeballs, and was absolutely convinced there was a soul-eating monster in my room somewhere. I didn't see it, but I knew it was there. It was just the whole the whole room was just seething with with negative, you know, really sort of demonic in the in the darkest sense energy. And you know, somehow I fell back asleep, not not quite sure what happened. But the following morning, my my girlfriend looked and she said, what's that on your chest? And I looked down and I, you know, so I could barely see it. So I went in the mirror and there was a red handprint on my chest. And she said, oh, you probably slept on your hand. And I, so I, you know, I'm, in, I'm standing there in the mirror trying to fit my hand on this print and it didn't quite fit. And the fingers were longer. And then I, I had this horrific realization when I realized that there it was the hand had six fingers, and it was distinct. It was like someone dipped their hand in red paint and slapped it on my chest. So I should also add, at the time, I was I was taking really high doses of melatonin to to more more to experiment with it than than for sleep. And I've always wondered if if the melatonin being a tryptamine, then maybe that sort of facilitated that extra component <laughs> of the sleep paralysis that left physical evidence on my skin. I think and, that's a good hypothesis because by the mid nineties, sorry, Michael, you're a little bit too old for like childhood <laughs> sleep paralysis. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it, 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 it was sink. It was just absolutely terrifying. And the way that you you know if you've had those experiences, there's just nothing. You know, you feel like you're going to die of. Fright. Oh yeah, and that's uh, exactly like my what heart it is. was going. Yeah. Like my heart was going to explode, and but but then to have a this confirmation, this physical print appearing, it, it's that's that's way up there of uh, of the, you know the the weirdest things that have ever happened in, in my life of lots of lots of weirdness that that one is that one's way at the top of the list it's uh yeah it's a doozy it's um that's a good one but okay so speaking of life of weirdness then you said you had a i'm just going to try to wind the clock back and we'll get to the 1990s mm-hmm. sighting but we've kind right. of gone to like middle school did you mm-hmm. know like, were you always going to be a writer? When when did your first interest in, in in that kind of in the creation of odd stories happen, or was could you not have a memory of a time when it wasn't there? I, I I honestly don't have a memory of a time when it wasn't there because I was such a voracious reader, and you know, credit that to to my parents who when my you know I'd I'd be dragged along to visit my my boring you know relatives and all my girl cousins that, that I couldn't stand to be around and I would just sit and read a book and my, my parents were always okay with that. You know, people would say, Oh, he's going to get warped, especially when I started reading horror, Stephen King and uh, you know, even classic horror that, that the kids read back then it, that, you know, I'd go to the school book fair and there would be Frankenstein and war of the worlds and uh, the invisible man. The, you know, these were the books that were 
there for kids to read. You know, there was no young adult literature at the time. It was just books. So I started reading all this stuff. And I, I remember writing my first uh, story. I, I, I got a typewriter for Christmas. And I remember sitting and writing my first horror short story. And I'll never forget, there was a graveyard near my house from the, um, from the eight, late 18, I'm sorry, late 19th century. And I would frequently just go and hang out, again, the weird kid thing. I would just hang out at this graveyard. I thought it was really cool and just like to spend time there. And I wrote a short story about a kid who went to that, went to a graveyard. And the spirits of um, the, the, uh, a man and a woman who had lost a child they, they sort of capture him and take him and drag him down with them. And I, the, the experience of writing something that was simultaneously scaring the shit out of me was, was a revelation. You know, like, wow, I can do this. You know, this is, this is good. I'm, I'm scaring myself, so it's got to be scary for somebody else. I'm the one that's making this stuff up. And f- from the from the get go, I was always drawn to the macabre, to the weird. You know, Halloween was my favorite holiday. I couldn't wait to you know put some monster makeup on my face and you know and scare people and uh, and that's that's the stuff I read and uh, obviously it's the stuff I write now. I, I I I sometimes write other sorts of material, but there's always that that dark element under the surface it's just who i am it's 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 the only thing i find that i can write and and write effectively and so uh i i guess i figured that because that that tends to be especially when it's uh specialist and emotionally intense and and you have a childhood like that it's just always been there at some time Mm -hmm. it's kind of cool you did horror story my my first writing stuff was not <laughs> it was fantasy though i guess it was a uh-huh. kind of weird yeah. sci-fi version of fantasy so there were barbarians like as in a in a conan style but they were also like flying sort of like inspector gadget cars so Oof. that was like my earliest writing i um i hope i've slightly improved although there's probably still, still something <laughs> in that story um so <laughs> If we like, what was the? Um, let's do the maths on this then. So the mm. 1990 experience. It's really exciting to have someone. You and Miguel are the closest people, both named Michael, uh, who have had like as close as possible to UFO uh, experiences in early childhood. I guess Chris Knowles as well. All right, so there's mm-hmm. three of you. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the 1991? Good company. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it does seem to coordinate with people of our, you know, our general age, it, it, that, that, that era, it, it seems a, a lot of this Kids kind of thing is going on. In the seventies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, it was, um, in 1990, I was at, uh, the beach on the, the, uh, Maryland coast, uh, ocean city, Maryland. My mom had bought a condo there, uh, for a for a couple of years, so you know, I used to go down with friends, and I, you know, it was um, I was a little older at this point. Um, let's see, um, I was I was in my tw- my twenties, and uh, and you know, so we liked to party, and we'd we'd go to the beach and hang out and drink beer and other stuff, and um, so one weekend I was there with my with my girlfriend at the time, and. Have to back it up a little bit. I woke up on, I guess it was Sunday morning. It was, I think, it was September twenty third. I, I wrote, I wrote all this down so I can, I can reference the actual dates and everything. But I woke up and I had had a dream about a UFO panel, and there were, it was, it was almost like um, there was this, like every element of ufology was being personified. There was a Jacques Vallée type person talking you know it's sort of valet-ish manner about control systems and things like that there was like a stan freeman guy nuts and bolts talking about ufos and 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 a couple others and it's the 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 conversation just degenerated when a david ike sort of character started saying they're demons they're gonna eat your children blah, blah, blah. And then I woke up from the stream. I thought, that's kind of weird. I, I never dream about, I like UFOs. I read a lot about this stuff, but I've never had a dream like that. So I wrote the dream down 
And uh, later that that evening, w- my girlfriend and I realized we're like we just been hanging out. We haven't even been to the beach. Let's go take a walk on the beach before we get in the car to drive home. So it was a September, late September evening. The beach was completely deserted. It was a beautiful starry night. No, not a cloud in the sky. I mean, it was just gorgeous. And as we're walking along the beach, I. I noticed it looked like someone had sculpted a face in the sand, but a tire track had gone across it. And that took me back to a couple of weeks before when we'd been at the beach, when my friends and I were were sculpting things in the sand. And this was a different part of the beach entirely. And I had made an alien head with his arm like he was waving at the sky. And this was weeks before this particular evening. So I, I thought, oh, that's kind of funny, you know, another head in the sand. And I looked up at the sky and I said, mentally, my girlfriend was, had walked a little bit closer to the water. I looked up at the sky and said, okay, if you're out there, this is the perfect time to show yourselves. And I was, you know, joking. I was at least 90% joking. I, I had very little belief that anything was going to happen. But a few minutes later, my girlfriend points up at the sky and she says, what are those? And when she was looking at them, it was two orange orbs, blobs, whatever. And they were just kind of next to each other, kind of bobbing up and down. And when I followed her finger where she was pointing and I saw them, they started shooting across the sky and doing crazy maneuvers. And I started saying, oh, my God, oh, my God. And she started saying, oh, my God, oh, my God. And we're just watching these lights and they're they're just doing erratic moves throughout this clearly propelled too. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't Chinese lanterns. These things were moving. And at one point they came together and fused and were flying as one. And then they split up again. And then they just shot off into the distance. And at that moment I was, it was, it was more a feeling of awe than terror, but it was kind of scary at the same time because I thought, what, what just happened and what happens now? So we, we, we left the beach and got in the car and drove home. The, 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 the coda to the story is we, we got home and her, the, the next day we, we told her father, who was a real salt of the earth kind of you know straight up dude. And we told him the story, and I thought for sure he was going to laugh at us and accuse us of, of being high or whatever. And he said, oh, that's interesting. When I was a kid, I saw a silver disc fly over a cornfield when my friend and I were playing. And it was even written up in the paper in Indiana. So, you know, that was sort of the capstone on, on, this, on this whole experience. And what, what struck me and – what pushed my thinking in ufology in the in the direction that that where it is now, which is more Jacques Vallée, Jeffrey Kripal, uh, so, some of what Strieber has has speculated, is that it was so tied to my consciousness with the the dream first of all, and then the the weird synchronicity of seeing the face in the sand after having you know, sculpted my, an alien face in the sand a few weeks earlier. It, it, it it was all just too, too deeply tied to consciousness for me to think I just happened. This, all this stuff was just a happy coincidence. And at the time when some, some, you know, little guys in a spaceship were, were were flying their, their ships around in the sky. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, the alien head was also waving. So you're essentially, putting up some sort of Nazca lines, if you will. Uh, <laughs> and I guess it's interesting that the, uh, your girlfriend at the time's father uh, had an experience as a kid as well, because we've only, there haven't really been enough generations since the UFO phenomenon became how we conceptualize it in the last, say, 80 years. But uh, it is interesting to note that there does appear to be a kind of intergenerational component to it. So you might have had mm-hmm. you might have had all the pieces to kind of unlock the door, if you will. Yeah, that's that's a great analogy. That, that, that that's what it felt like. And and my father, uh, you know, the the reason talk about intergenerational. I think the reason he was into 
the the paranormal as much as he was is he had some unusual experiences when he was a kid too. A man um, he met in a park who could throw his voice into a tree and just seemed to be doing things that were you know impossible, as well as seeing a disembodied head floating above his bed when when he was a child too. So I I absolutely believe there's there, there's some kind of you know blood genetic factor in all of this as well for sure now uh when was the uh, do you have a like what was your first memory or your first encounter with the tarot when did you first realize it was a thing that existed yeah the, uh my my aunt who always loved to spoil me and my brother she she would take us to this this weird sort of store it was kind of, it was like a kmart of of odd stuff they they always had the strangest I think I think they they sort of retailed stuff that other bigger stores wouldn't sell, and she bought me the James Bond 007 tarot deck. Do you still have it? I still have it. Excellent. Yeah, yes, I, I I still have it. It's actually it's worth quite a bit of of well, money I've, now. I've it's, never heard of it. Is it the is it a, a James Bond tarot or is it a live and let die tarot? Yeah, well, it was it was created for Live and Let Die, uh, and um, it was uh, it was a Jane Seymour, I think, was the was sort of the the witch, the the voodoo woman uh, who who read Bond's cards. But the the deck is actually it's now known as the Tarot of the Witches, and it has nothing to do with witchcraft. They just slapped that name on it by an artist, Fergus Hall. It's it's a really sort of weird surreal deck really the 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 majors are are really are, are quite beautiful and and odd and, and in a very you know surrealist sort of style that it, it was a really beautiful deck and it came with a a um a little like sort of mat made out of paper that you could put down that had the celtic cross diagrammed on it and what each of the positions meant so I think it was about 11 years old, and I got this I got this uh, tarot set, and this is another thing I inflicted on my poor friends and family because I would I would you know get this deck out, put out this layout sheet, and have someone sit down, and I put down one card at a time, look it up in the book, read what it said in the uh, book, and it would just take you. absolutely <laughs> excruciating, yeah. And somehow they they didn't slap me in the face or you know. Th- flip the thing in the air and and run away so i guess i had very um very tolerant friends and family but that was that really was the and i was hooked i the the um the 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 pip cards were were not were non-scenic so they were just you know two cups and three swords and things like that so that that it it took me a while before i really until you know about um, in my adult life before I started to really understand that the pip cards were really useful too. But that was the deck that, that, that did it for me. And I, I still have it. I, I still take it out once in a while. Uh, I've moved on to using other decks, but it's, it's nice to have that, you know, this, this is where it all began. This, this goofy James Bond 007 tarot. Uh, and what was uh, the book like in it? I mean, did it did it give a, a sort of brief and presumably an accurate overview of the history of the tarot, or was it just, yeah, here you go? Yeah, that, I I don't remember much about, about the book. Um, it it had you know it had a, a decent. I think I think the material was was pretty decent. Of course, back then there were still a lot of myths uh, about the tarot that were you know promulgated and 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 a lot of books and things, but but it, it was it it. It had a a good esoteric grounding, uh, and the the majors like I still you know I, I looked at these cards so many times like I close my eyes and still see the those majors because they they just were eventually got burned into my brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, my first well kind of my first uh, I, I was I saw an old 
um, just like playing card quality right await in a news agents in my hometown and asked mother if I could have it. I would have been about 11 and she said, absolutely not. And I eventually uh, bought one, uh, not a right await. It was a, an Arthurian one a couple of years later. And because mm-hmm. I used it so much, every time I open a new deck now, uh, my understanding of the quote unquote traditional associations of the card are kind of passed through <laughs> the uh the way they're interpreted in the in the arthurian uh, context and i have to kind of sure, de-arthurian sure. the ones that require it because <laughs> that my, my mind is just that's what my those definitions and those kind of um divinatory meanings are the ones that i associate with each card regardless of the deck which gets quite jarring because i have tarot of the pirates <laughs> ufo tarot and things that uh-huh. aren't quite a good match yeah yeah i like that ufo tarot too that's uh the, i i thought it would be schlocky but it, it was surprisingly evocative the the imagery in that yeah it's um uh, Los Carabeo is, I, I guess, when you do that kind of volume, some of them are, some of them are dumpster fires, but other ones, oh are, yeah, uh, other ones you go, wow, this is surprisingly good. The book seems to have randomly generated meanings and associated them to the cards, which is odd. Uh-huh. But uh-huh. Uh, I, I've never. This is. I'm looking at it right now. My the the new desk or the new old desk has about fifteen different card decks on it because those are the only things that fit in the old slots that used to have mail uh right uh, so i'm looking at it it's the one i can it is the horse i cannot tame (laughs) (laughs) yeah all right so let's let's back it up then um sure michael what even is the tarot yeah well that's a well that's a whopper of a question um it's it's uh i see it as a uh you know, I, I I teach I teach tarot. I've been teaching for several years now, and I have something called Tarot Boot Camp, where I try to get people up to speed and and competent at reading in a day, in like a, a a long day, a six to eight hour day. And the first thing I teach is the history, because there's there's so much misinformation and. Even now, you know, in tarot forums, people people get very angry. If if you're someone like me that 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 tries to stick to a factual history of of what we know, so I, I always begin with telling telling my students that that tarot is a game. It it originated as a game, and it it has a that it has heavy symbolic weight there, there's no doubt these images are are profound images and there's you know there are lots of theories about the progression of the of the trump cards and things like that um but but it really it, it initially was a game and and it, it what it has become is a very profound spiritual tool and I believe there's no there's there's no disconnect between that. It's yeah. even 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 though it, it was a game, that that doesn't mean it, it could not have transformed over time. But also it's a, I mean I kind of mentioned this in, in Chaos Protocols, but it's a failure to understand what a game was in thirteenth century Italy. Um this mm-hmm. is this is before we have a mathematical understanding of probability, which we got with the French like three centuries later. Mm-hmm. So the idea of a, the difference between game and divination isn't quite uh as clear cut as we have it now in a post Milton Bradley world. It's uh you're still kind of meddling in god's business because yes. you are kind of d- daring the future to change and the future belongs to god so uh even though it was a game it was still kind of creepy and be- and with a failure of well not a failure but with an incomplete understanding of of probability and uh, and that kind of mathematical difference and likelihood playing a game is a bit like ooh you know, I mean, games of chance were kind of banned because, or looked down upon by the church for this reason, that you're, you're sort of mm-hmm. um, messing in God's business, which is the future. And it's that bit that I think people want it to be, you know, the gypsies took it from Egypt. Uh, mm-hmm. It's to, even when you get the history right, you don't remove the magic from it. You actually plug it into something, you plug it into the, the kind of authentic story of it because it certainly accretes all these other things over time but at its genesis point at least in europe um, 
just because it's a gay it's a failure of modern words um to distinguish between game and divination that wasn't really what was going on there they certainly weren't like it doesn't appear that they were using it to say oh should i buy this farm but um <laughs> they would be aware that playing the game had something to do with the future Yes, I, and just playing a game in itself, like like you said, is altering the future, and it brings in that. It, it I mean, you're 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 trying to pull on luck. You're you're trying to alter probability. This was a game where people bet money, and whenever you're doing that, you it it leads to magical thinking, uh, c- clearly, be, because you're. You, you know, there's there's the whole idea of luck and how you enhance luck and what you talk about is, you know, probability enhancement and things like that. That's just that goes with the idea of playing a game, especially playing a game where there are stakes involved like it was. It was a trick taking game. It was a, you know, a, a betting game. And yeah, what, what, and there's also the, the, the dangerous element that I think people miss as well is that there's it's there's a there's a little bit of sedition in it because this trick taking game has uh images of people that have high political status and you kind of have the on again off again high priestess as an example of where this might get dodgy but you also have mm-hmm. the banning of or the attempted replacement of court cards specifically kings in the napoleonic era because it's like no kings we're we're a republic and uh, so the the depictions have uh, th- there's a kind of weird sedition component to it in the same way that you would uh, be banned from casting horoscopes for members of the royal family. Mm-hmm. Here we are in the taverns uh, gambling on, on this cards that have some sort of medieval morality play story attached to some of them. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they have pictures of people of high state and they were in fact sponsored like by by high status families so this is where it it starts to get and i find that more interesting than some sort of it it fell to the gypsies to retain the wisdom of thoth and and like that stuff is 19th century french nonsense but the the actual story is fucking cool on its own yeah yeah it, it it really is and a, a lot of the traditional histories of tarot, when you you know you read the historians' books, Dumay and 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 the other major scholars, they they basically draw a line. They say that you know before uh, the the Jebelin in you know like se- the 1780 or something like that, when all the all the French Freemasons and Martinists and Esotericists really kind of glommed on t- to the tarot they say that there it, it wasn't it, it wasn't used for anything occult before that yeah. and that's 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 completely untrue there's um just just recently i i um i discovered a couple of things during the inquisition in venice in the late 16th century there was a woman named isabella bellocchio and the it's it's in the records of the inquisition that that she was uh uh, persecuted by them, she was trying to get her lover back. Of course, you know what's the, you know the the major spell in any any grimoire. You know it's always trying to get the the lover to come back. And what she was doing, and, and this is in the record, but you, you don't you hear it that much. She was uh, burning uh, lamps or candles. And there's there's another there's another account very similar to this uh, to the devil. And she would, she would, she was accused of loosening her hair, and kneeling before a lamp or or candle, uh, in front of the devil card, and and praying to the devil card, and you know, um, and using, uh, you know, either spells or somehow petitioning the devil to bring her lover back, and there, that's mentioned in another. Uh, episode in, in the um, record of the Inquisition as well. So it seems this was this was kind of a common thing. And well, that's interesting uh, to me, just because that seems that's like the positive evidence to the kind of gap evidence in the Visconti Sforza deck, where there mm-hmm. are major arcana missing, including the the, the quote unquote bad ones like the Devil in the right. Tower. With the Tower. Mm-hmm. So we don't have the uh, textual evidence to suggest that that was that was done because they were aware they could be used for magic, but then you do mm-hmm. have. You know, as you just mentioned, there's inquisitorial evidence that shows that people were using these cards for magic. And mm-hmm. that is, I think, a very good analysis of 
why there are so many sort of on again, off again moments in the major arcana during the, the quote unquote, the Italian phase, if you will. So mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. first European phase is, is, it's largely games of chance that were used, um, at a low quality level in the taverns. And then as a kind right. of higher, um, or, or, or an upper class sort of parlor game for, you know, these sort of rich North Italian families. And, mm-hmm. and the use in those two areas is very different. I, I kind of, we'll get to it in a second, but, uh, it becomes "quote unquote" esoteric in the, in the next phase, which is the French, if you will, and that's the kind right. of that's the official history. I think again, it's a failure of understanding uh, what magic would have looked like in 16th century Italy, uh, because these thing uh, th- that whole idea of use of images is the sort of cornerstone of the the renaissance model not just in magic but in art and and mm-hmm. so you have mm-hmm. these it's um they would have been used it's just that they they get um the french phrase may be described as kind of uh, agglomerating as many things as possible to it so the the astrology right. and the, and the, and and kabbalah and the, and the hebrew alphabet and and then attaching it to the the sort of egyptosophical um, esotericism at the time, but the the Italian one. This is what I mean. It, it's actual, uh, yeah. It's actual history is more interesting and more magical because it's some sort of dodgy off book stuff, right? And I, I've always thought these these images. I mean, you have to think of the people and the time. The the, the Visconti Sforza cards are painted in gold and illuminated. The, these things are are talismans. You know, there, there, there's no other way to look at them. And you, this is, you know, this is an era where a painted image is is something that not that many people have. So these 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 images, if you if you put yourself in the time and the and the mindset of the time, I mean, to be holding, you know, the the death card, to be holding the wheel of fortune, to be holding the devil, obviously. It, what an impact that must have made this is this is the television of of the time well exactly and also embedding sort of high status families in this because you know they sponsored it and there's different um heraldry from both sides of the family and some discussion as to whether uh, some of the the humans actually depicted in it may have looked like family members and all that kind of thing that's mm-hmm. a spell that is like a post ficino mm-hmm. or a contemporary to ficino magical spell they they're using image correctly and 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 to to publish these cards it of itself is that kind of renaissance image magic exactly exactly it, it, the what you asked i i did i do have a definition of tarot i use sometimes and Go i on. call it i call it a gateway drug to magic and that that essentially is what it was for me uh, you know i'm 11 years old i'm i'm learning about divination with my james bond cards and as as time as time goes on I start, you know, I start reading more about it. Of course, I got my, you know, Rider Waite, Rider Waite Smith deck, and uh, and that leads to that leads to magic. As soon as you start reading anything about tarot, you 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 hit that, uh, you know, the 18th century. You 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 read about Atea. You read about Court de Jebelin. You learn about the Golden Dawn, and that's that's what happened to me. I said, oh, there's there's something behind all of this, and it took me a long time to sort of unlearn uh, all that, all the the 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th century esoteric stuff that that while I think it's valuable, and I practiced the Golden Dawn system for a long time, it's 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 coherent, it works. Um, for me, that it's only been in the last ten years or so that I've I've force myself to kind of unlearn that and go back to the roots of of tarot out of that i i've had to sort of cleanse my brain of all that complexity of the decans and the and you know all that and the astrological associations and all the crowley stuff that's been i call it esoteric cruft that that's that's sort of accumulated on on all of on these cards and and in in my mind it's 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 kind it's sort of sucked the 
the the real spiritual essence, the real magical essence out of out of the cards. So it, the the past you know ten years or so, I've been trying to reorient myself, and in a way, it, it, it it's similar to what I see a lot of magicians doing, and that's that's you know moving away from the the golden dawn and and later developments from that and going back to the grimoires going back to the uh the the pgm th- things like that and that's that's what's happening to me is I'm, I, I'm i'm returning to the sort of the the early the early decks and and i feel there's such power there well this is definitely where i wanted the conversation to go so i will what i will do uh and, and we'll kind of jump sequence by sequence uh, and and i'll get your opinion for people who are listening and funny enough if, if you're kind of new wish to the tarot in the last couple of years it, it is as you just said quite the golden age because mm-hmm. there is still value in um going sort of etea papu or that that kind of thing there's still value mm-hmm. in learning it in learning that part of tarot's journey as long as mm-hmm. you learn it once you learn the history, so the the because I think that kind of in a weird way I think the French phase peaked in its English phase with um, Crowley in the Book of Thoth. But I'll, I'll describe what mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. I consider to be the sort of phases of Tarot's history, including today. And uh, you let me know what you think, Mister Tarot expert, and then we mm-hmm. can kind of mm-hmm. jump in because this could be potentially quite useful for people. So we've described the Italian mm-hmm. phase, which is tavern game, uh, elite pastime, used for off book magic. For which the um, you kind of have to combine, you you have to sort of collate evidence from other parts of what was going on with magic. We mm-hmm, had the French mm-hmm. phase, um, which we you know you can we can define as the Marseille tarot deck. But the reality is, the majority of the French phase happened in Paris. In in many respects, um, the tarot as an esoteric implement is kind of like Paris's gift to magic, uh, for for better or for worse. So we had people there who. Um, would begin to incorporate emerging esoteric ideas, um, astrology, Christianized versions of Kabbalah, uh, Hebrew alphabet in, into a specific system. Uh, and w- that's where it blended with sort of Masonic lodges. So you mentioned um, Kurt de Gebelin. Mm-hmm. I don't think mm-hmm. um, not that many people know that he was in the same Masonic lodge as Ben Franklin <laughs> and Voltaire. <laughs> yes. So his yes. sort of project with the tarot is very similar to the sort of American project. This is the, the opportunity of hearing the tarot and putting it out in the world was uh, for him a restoration of that magical golden age so that mm-hmm. kind of defines and, and you, then you move into the 19th century still in the french phase with obviously eliphas levy so, and uh-huh. papu's kind of central european rather than french but we mm-hmm. can put him in there right so the, the french phase mm-hmm. is all this kind of uh pulling together of different strands and then we hit uh the sort of british imperial phase where mm-hmm. we get the uh, Rider Waite Smith deck, which itself mm-hmm. is remarkable. Like, I'm I'm glad that people are actually starting to put Smith, and in this case, for people listening, that's Pamela Coleman Smith, back into mm-hmm. the name rather than Waite and the publisher, because she painted them and she did something very remarkable, which is she. Uh, painted the miners in a way that gave them actual images. And she got some of that. She obviously had a solar busca deck because um, some mm-hmm. of them are, are versions of, so tying it back into the early Italian phase. But that's what the English mm-hmm. phase was providing entry into depths of meaning in tarot. Uh, and the Rider Waite Smith deck surprised people with its popularity, and, and we, we kind of, it reaches its apogee, um, the English phase with, um, Crowley's Book of Thoth and, mm-hmm. um, the sort of Harris Crowley project. It reaches mm-hmm. its apogee because it brings in stuff that is the kind of necessary conclusion to the English phase. So he can bring in, admittedly, early to mid 20th century Crowley inflected versions of things like anthropology and, and, and Taoism. And, and mm-hmm. but it's, it's depicted in a way that is invitational. And then we have maybe the modern phase. Mm-hmm. Um, so from the sort of American New Age. And here is something changes with what I think. And let me know your, your feeling on this. Mm-hmm. What marks the difference between a New Age phase of tarot and the sort of English or British imperial phase is the detachment of the 
reader's power from the power inherent in the images. So we start to get like with Voyager mm -hmm. Tarot stuff, just like use your intuition. These are tools to, mm -hmm. to, to allow your intuition to come through. There's, there's no inherent magic in the complexity of the symbol. And that's been the phase for about, that was a phase for about 25 years. And it, it led to a, mm -hmm. you know, a great flowering through the new age and, and into the nineties. We did get, uh, you know, Los Carabeo publishing a great clip and, and, and sort mm -hmm. of this warmed over seventies Jungian idea that it's, it's an, it's a tool for the reader's intuition. And mm -hmm. what I think we're in the kind of post phase now where we can we have that we we have the opportunity to look at the history of tarot as a as a meta well as a meta journey which we've just kind of done mm -hmm. by breaking it into mm -hmm. phases and then really i think the bit that needs to be restored is actually some of these symbols do have their own complexity and personality kind of pulling the italian bit back at the mm -hmm. end of the new age where it was just sort of washed out as it's just a guide for your intuition and that brings us, I think, right to the cusp of potentially a tarot renaissance. But that's my potted history of the tarot. What do you think? Mm -hmm. I think you're, you're spot on. It, 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 to me, um, what, what happened to me, I, I still teach the, the Rider Waite Smith deck. I, I think it's, it's, it's just simply the easiest system for someone to pick up. They, with with the illustrated minor cards, you know, there's there's stuff going on. There's people. There's scenes, and she she drew that from the Solabuska deck, which had just gone on display in the British Museum. So uh, so Pamela and Arthur, or maybe just Pamela, would go and sit and look at the look at the old images of these ancient decks to recreate hers. And she was also a synesthete and a clairvoyant. So it's it's a rich deck. It's really rich. And well, I, I, she was an actress. She was mm -hmm. friends with Bram Stoker. Like she was a, a remarkable woman. Like I, that's what I, I'm glad that because Lady Frida Harris was always. Um, I I think she had as close to co-equal billing as as women could get in in Edwardian England with Crowley with their mm -hmm, project. Mm -hmm, Pamela mm -hmm. Coleman Smith has only recently <laughs> um, <clears throat> kind of been given that. The, the honor that was hers to begin with, which is this is a co uh, a co project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she she's she's her story is is just phenomenal, and I, I spend a lot of time in my class talking about her. Um, it, uh, unfortunately, what happened to me is just to to put my history in with the history. I got I got sucked into the the Golden Dawn uh, magical philosophy and. After a while, I just felt like I was being pulled into this black hole of complexity that I was never going to get out if I if I stuck with that system. And so, what what changed me around? Um, I even had the the Cicero's Golden Dawn Tarot. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's kind of I cartoonish, yeah. but but it's very you know it, it's it's consistent with with the 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 Book of Tea. And uh, and the Golden Dawn system, yeah. So really deeply immersed in in that approach to to tarot. And then I read uh, Alejandro Hodorowsky's book, The Way of Tarot: The Spiritual Teacher in the Cards. Can I just and, interrupt? Because one sure, of my further sure. questions is, mm -hmm. what do you think is the best book on tarot? Oh yeah, okay. Um, and is it is it Hodorowsky? <laughs> it Hodorowsky's is one of the best. Yeah, all right. The, he ma the he other, makes the podium. Yes, yes. He's he's up on the top shelf for sure. Also on the top shelf are um, Meditations on the Tarot by Valentin Tomberg. It's it's the book that intro introduced me to Hermeticism, essentially, um, uh, Christian Hermeticism. The fascinating thing about that book, it's a tarot book. The the one thing you have to get past it's um, Tom Berg was kind of a right a political right winger so there's there's little there's elements to, and and very much a Catholic a Roman traditionalist at the same time he was a Hermeticist and the fascinating thing about that book there's a photo of John Paul II with meditations on the tarot on his desk 
And that always, <laughs> that's always blown me away to think that, that the Pope was sitting there reading this book about tar- her radical Catholic hermeticism. Um, so, so that, that's, that's the other book that's up there. Meditations. Yes. Yeah. Hodorowsky, Meditations on the Tarot. Um, all the, any book by Gareth Knight on the tarot, he's got one called The Magical World of the Tarot, I believe it's called. And there's a relatively newer book by um, an Israeli named Yoav Bandov called Tarot, the Open Reading. And Yoav studied with uh, Hodorovsky, so it's, it's mired in that um, Tarot de Marseille tradition and sort of the Yodorovsky and approach to tarot. But he, his, his style of reading, he calls the open reading. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's essentially the style that I teach now. And that, that could be a whole conversation unto itself. But, but as, as, as far as the books go, the, the, and I have to say one more. Um, <laughs> so my top shelf's kind of full, but there's, there's a book called The Inner Guide Meditation, by Edwin Steinbrecher. A lot of people don't know about this, I've but this never is the, heard of it. Yeah, it's it is an amazing book. Israel Regardi called it one of the most significant contributions to occult history in modern times. It it essentially it's it combines uh, Jungian active imagination and astrology and tarot. So it's it's similar to what the Golden Dawn and others did, where you would you would you know you sort of go into a, a meditative state and encounter the archetype of the card. It I have to admit I didn't go through the entire system, but when I was using that particular system, it it was another one of those aha moments where it really where you could see the effects of the inner work that you're doing on the outer world directly mirrored it it is a it is an amazing system essentially it's it's uh you 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 go into your imagination a dialogue with with the cards it, it but what happened is when steinbrecher started doing this he was he was undergoing um jungian therapy at the time he he ran into the devil uh, who he called Old Pan, and he was in this visionary state, and the devil was standing there, and the devil wouldn't let him leave the state, and he was terrified that he was going to be found, you know, just completely unconscious and never get out. So he he somehow managed to move his finger and pull himself out of that state. So later he thought, well, what? He talked to his therapist, and the therapist said, "Well, why not get in touch with your demon, your your inner guide, your holy guardian angel, whatever you want to call it, and see if if that guide can take you through safely." So it's 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 a method of of contacting your demon and allowing it to take you through the the archetypes of the cards. It's an astounding system, and several people I've talked to that have that have done it. Have said it's by far the most powerful tarot-related magic or or meditative experience that they've ever done. So I it, I highly recommend the book. Uh, Steinbrecher's I, I I don't think he's around anymore, but he's to teach people this system called the Inner Guide Meditation System. It's a it's a phenomenal book on on a number of levels. Well, we will have a um, Michael Hughes tarot book podium uh, in the show notes for people listening uh but going back to your journey because we left it at hodorowsky mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sure yeah H- hodorowsky i read this story um if, if you haven't heard it it's such a great story he he writes about it in the introduction of the book he he collected he he became fascinated with tarot and he had uh, over a thousand decks at one point and he uh leonora carrington gave him a, um, a Rider weight Smith deck and he was very excited and he, he took it to Andre Breton, the surrealist. And he was so excited. He, uh, Breton was, was meeting with his circle of surrealist and Hodorowsky says, check out this deck. You know, isn't it, isn't it amazing? And he thought Breton was going to love it. And Breton looked at it and said, essentially, this is crap. He said, this is, 
this is obvious. All the symbolism is obvious. He said there's one deck, and that's the, the Tarot de Marseille. It, 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 it moves you, but it does not give up its secrets. It still maintains its secrets. So Hodorowsky threw away all of his decks, oh, well, every other it. deck but the Marseille. <laughs> <laughs> and he just said, all right, man, if, if Andre says this is the way to go, this is the way to go. And, and that became the genesis of his study. And that, that kind of struck me because I was starting to feel that um, particularly when I try to teach people, I, I felt like, you know, I, the, the, the symbolism hit is so um, blatant in the Rider Waite Smith. You know, you, you look at the fool card. He's got a little white rose. He's, you know, gaily attired. He's, he's stepping over the cliff. The little dog is, is, is barking, you know, trying to stop him or warn him or whatever. But if you look at the, at the Marseille tarot, the fool is, is, I, I have one deck, the the um, Jean Noble uh, Marseille deck, where the fool's pants are completely ripped off, his junk is hanging down, and the cat or the dog, whatever, is like you know a millimeter away from shredding his penis and his balls. And you look at the magician. The magician in the Rider Waite Smith deck is is you know is an esoteric occult magician he's got the elemental tools on the table when you look at the magician which is actually le batteleur uh, or juggler um, in the marseille deck he's just a street magician with a table full of stuff and it's so i started thinking you know maybe I, I was having a hard time teaching people because they would get so focused on all the little symbolic elements and all the cards. And the idea when I started playing with the Marseille deck and the older decks is like, you know, when you wipe out all of that esoteric cruft that has been just has been accreting on the cards over time as, as you know, different different systems adopted the cards and changed them, what you get, what you can get are actually a lot wider ranging meanings and associations. And you're dealing with something that's a little more pure and that's a little more open and, and isn't, you know, isn't encrusted with the belief systems of all these, all these people over time. Yeah. I think, uh, and interestingly, I think this is a perspective that can only happen in a post new age world. Because the other thing mm -hmm. I forgot to mention in my potted history of the tarot, once it hits the sort of 70s, and it's kind of defined by the Voyager tarot, right? Um, mm -hmm. When you detach the quote-unquote natural intuitive powers of a reader from the inherent complexity of, of the symbols, which is the sort of very French plus um, Rider Waite Smith plus Crowley version of it, mm -hmm. it opens up, and this is how we ended up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different tarots. So, as I said, tarot of the pirates, Arthurian tarot, Star Wars tarot, what have you. Right, right. Uh, and that happens in a, in a New Age sense because in, in some respects, the um, sort of asserting the independence of, of the symbol associated with the, the original card has been diminished in favor of kind of wishy-washy uh, intuition. And it mm -hmm. kind of, I think it gets to a peak where you can kind of look back and go, okay, well, uh, most of this is nonsense. And, and then you get to the point where you go, well, then, frankly, so that's the case with the uh, Rider Waite Smith ones as well. And, and it does allow you to have that journey back to the original complexity of the symbol, having gone round the houses through this journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think that's why we're kind of at the beginning of a new golden age of tarot, because we have the opportunity to recognize and acknowledge and extract the useful bits out of its previous, its sort of, shall we say, four century detour and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and fit it back into the kind of context of the history of European magic with a view to using it in a more potent way. And let me, oh, cause I'm going to ask you this, um, where, like, what do you think is good in tarot today? You've just come back from giving a talk at a conference. Like, um, what, what, where, where is tarot at these days and what's good and bad about it? Let me give you an example of what I mean. And I, I view this as mm -hmm. kind of good. 
So one of the sort of trends in tarot over the last few years, which I approve of, uh, at least in theory, in, within the wider context that we're talking about, is the kind of use of the images in, in freezes. So each card mm. of each... Um, so the cards of a particular suit, the images on them will form one picture if you go from the ace to, um, up through the court cards. And that's been one mm-hmm. of the things that's happened in the last few years that I quite like. I, I mm-hmm. think that helps as as a way of kind of demonstrating the interconnectivity of the different meanings within a suit or within the major arcana. It's sort of major arcana-ing uh, the suits. And that's mm-hmm. that's that's new and I like it if it's done correctly. But so what, what's going on in tarot world today and what's good and bad? Yeah. Well, the bad is is there's still a proliferation of um, what it, Enrique Enriquez uh, terms fantasy decks. And, uh, you know, I, 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 f- I sound like a snob. I am a bit of a snob. You know, the, this, the Star Wars tarot, the gummy bear tarot, things like that. I mean, just seem rather silly to me. I, I think any, any set of images can work as an oracle, you know, I, I made something called the symbols game probably about 20 years ago where I just took little pieces of paper and put symbols on them, like a, a dollar sign, a letter, um, you know, a knife, things like that, and mixed them up in this little replica Olmec head I have, and would just pick the symbols out and, and lay them out. And it, it worked extraordinarily well. This homemade basic oracle you know, that I just thought, well, if, if you can reduce things to, s- you know, simple symbols, let's see if that works. But but I feel like the s- so many decks are, are still building themselves on the Rider-Waite-Smith. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the Three of Swords is still a heart with swords through it. It just might be, you know, um, pagan theme swords or something like that or, or lightsabers, lightsabers yeah, exactly. right, right or cutlasses exactly. yeah right but but it's still it's all built on that model as if the the, the rider wade smith images are somehow primal and everything must be based upon them that, that's one problem uh th- that i see what i think is a is a good thing and i'm sort of um putting myself as a champion of returning to the older decks. There's such a variety now of, of facsimile decks, of reproduction decks. There are artists that are doing amazing, amazing work with ancient decks. And there's also, I think there it's, we can rediscover some of these other decks, not non canonical tarot, like the Minkiate decks, um, which have, they happen to have the four elements as cards and how useful is that to a magician um they have you know instead of using you know this kind of forced zodiacal astrological associations that that the golden dawn and crowley uh promoted the minkiate deck has um has the 12 signs of the zodiac as cards so we can we can you know we can go back to some of these older decks and find new ways to use them. The Mantegna Tarot is another one. It's, it's basically a, a treat, you know, it's a 50 card education on Neoplatonic philosophy. It has, you know, incredible images that, that could be useful, not, not just for divination and, and the usual stuff, but, but for magical purposes or, uh, or, or, or others. And the, the, there's just, we were so lucky that you know, a hundred years ago, you'd have to go to the Br- British Museum or some museum in Paris to even see these cards, and now we can actually hold them. So there's there's just this wealth of history, and as someone who loves this history and is so passionate about this history, to to see that there's a growing movement towards you know re- reawakening all, all the all these old decks and and putting them to use that that that's what I find really really exciting about this which you said it's a it really is a golden age and and what i i like the word reawakening there because as you say i mean i'm looking at all my los Carabeo ones now because i love I, I, they're crazy i love them but <laughs> what would be good to see in the kind of big what i would like this golden age to look like is the, the similar kind of uh experimental publishing 
and a sort of exuberance of publishing based on something other than the Coleman Smith um yes images so as you, like mm-hmm. we why can't we have a tarot publishing renaissance based on um the Marseille or the Visconti Sforza or um right. what have you and and it is kind of happening as you say there's not only the the mm-hmm. facsimiles and, and and reproduction decks going on but people mm-hmm. are kind of creating their own within an appropriate range versions of something like the Marseille so it, it mm-hmm. it's a way of bringing the other parts of Tarot's sort of 7th century European journey um, into light with the context of the story that it goes around. And and that's what I would like to see happen in Tarotland moving forward. Uh, me, me too. And the 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 other thing that, uh, that Yodorovsky really sort of a- awakened me to is the idea that the tarot as a spiritual system, it's it, it's essentially a spiritual system unto itself. It's a self-contained system. And if you approach it without all the, the you know, with, without, without all the golden dawn baggage, and, all, and, and you know, I don't want to put all that down. It's, it's very useful. It was, I, I, we, I, we just I, read it wrong. I, I agree. Like we read it in the wrong yeah. sequence. It's, it's useful yeah. as long as people, People can get around to reading it. The Book of Thoth is still, like, if you want the shortcut, it's still mm-hmm. the best and apogee of of that way of kind of making the tarot about everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, people should still read it. Just yes. read it a little bit further down the line if you're new. Yeah, and, and it, it's part of the history. It's, it's important to understand where we are now. But f- f- for me, and when I started approaching the... Uh, Mostly the, the the Marseille. I think that's where the 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 system really kind of congealed, and it's where the the you know the Trumps found their place and have pretty much followed that pattern since then. So I've I've been using the the Marseille tarot fairly fairly exclusively, along with some uh, some other um, older older decks as well. But when when I started meditating on each of the cards, when I started doing sort of deep vision work with with each of the cards and trying to put aside all that I that I'd looked, studied over the years it really opened up and I really believe that if the the best way to approach especially the older tarots is to approach them on their own terms and develop a relationship with them develop a relationship with those characters those symbols on the cards without trying to force an interpretation on it exactly and exactly and and then they and then they start speaking to you yeah then they talk back and then you realize that there is you know and i don't care if it just if if this was just a game and it just so happened to to transform into a spiritual system it's a really deep powerful spiritual system if you engage with it well the great Uh, cosmic trick michael mm -hmm. is that the universe is a game so (laughs) you know what else would match the Uh, universe but a game yes and the when i think about the simulation uh idea that we're living in a simulation if the if there's any uh piece of code that allows you to hack it it is the tarot. It's it's it, it's it continues to amaze me. It continues to more than any other. You know, I did lots of sigil work. You know, and thanks to the chaos protocols, I I uh, sort of reinvigorated that practice not too long ago. But of of all the sort of magical systems that I've that I've worked with, the the, the tarot is the one that's still just. There's still so much there. It, it, it feels like there's so much depth ahead, and and this this renaissance with with so many people engaging, especially with these these older patterns and and the older models and the older iconography, I think is really is astounding. And, it is and astounding. We're we're so lucky. You know that I could pull up the you know, the Marseille Tarot on my phone. You know if I if I want to, and it's it, it's it's it, it like you said it's a golden age. I I only see it getting bigger. I see when it, when I go to conferences, when I talk to people, when I teach, it seems like there's there's really this interest 
more so than, you know, 10 years ago when people just wanted to, you know, do divination, tell fortunes, that sort of thing. There's really a, an interest in digging deep into this system. Can I tell you, like, a, a one of my kind of crazy esoteric uh, one of my crazy, I guess, unverified personal gnosis experiments uh, or experiences, <laughs> much like <laughs> when I tell people ayahuasca is a spirit on a mission, same thing with St. Cyprian. Mm -hmm. The spirits of the early cards are on a mission. Yes. Uh, and you just described the difference between 10 years ago and now. Mm -hmm. Where people were at it for, I mean, that gets us into their, you know, the heady days of the early noughties where people were, it was a, a, a little bit more of an acquisitional time pre-crash, right? So mm -hmm. divination in that very practical materialist sense, which I don't knock that like things need mm -hmm. to, you need to have an adequate system of divination as a magician. But the mm -hmm. difference now is the spirits of these early cards are on a mission. And and it's interesting that you kind of look at that at, at tarot events and go, people are now looking at engaging with them on their own terms rather than like, oh, you know, what does your Celtic cross spread look like? <laughs> that, that That's a, that's, I couldn't have put it any better, honestly. They, they, they do feel like they're on a mission. They are, they are independent entities in their own right. Hodorowsky's book is called The Spiritual Teacher in the Cards. And and Gareth Knight says the same thing, really. And uh, he, if if you start working with them, they start talking back. The, the, the Golden Dawn did their, you know, I, the, the one thing I give them credit for is they use the cards as talismans. They use them as, as visualization um, you know, they went into the the cards that, well, to, to get to know yeah, them. That's actually one of the, well, I've still got you, one of the last bits of sort of um, free advice for the listeners before we do the, how they, how, can, how they can find out more is when you said you started using particularly the Marseille ones as visualization tools and approaching them, give people a free, easy, simple way of using a, a, an image as a meditational tool to begin doing that. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you my the, the technique that worked the best for me, and it, it's it's a little bit of a variation of that Steinbrecher technique. Uh, get yourself an old deck, um, one of the Marseille decks. It it doesn't matter which, and t t start with the uh, fool. Take the fool card out and sit it on your desk, sit it on your dresser, and you know, meditate, try to, you know, take yourself into the card, it, you know, the very common technique of sort of projecting yourself in and then opening your inner eyes and looking around, do, do that sort of thing as a preliminary, but then go about your daily life and wait until the fool manifests absolutely incontrovertibly in your waking life. And then move on to the magician and do the same thing, but don't force it. That that's I think that's that's the problem. Is if you well you know that guy had a you know had a pack on his back. No, it should be it should be something that knocks you over, and that you will find it, it may take you a year or so to do. I've done it twice, and just. Go through the cards and wait for that card to manifest itself in your real life. It's it's the most powerful uh, way of getting to know the cards and to seeing the manifestation of the inner reality of the card in the uh, in the exterior world. Well, that was splendid advice. And Michael, this has been a lovely conversation. I feel like and you know, we realistically could, I just run out of space on this computer. We could talk for hours and hours <laughs> about tarot because it's just so fucking cool. So it is. thank you very much for your time. And for people who'd like to know more, Michael, and obviously everyone listening does, where might I they hope to so. find you? Yes. Uh, my, my books, my fiction, all that stuff, everything, uh, is at Michael M Hughes.com. And there's a link to my tarot boot camp website from there, but but the michaelmhughes.com is where is the central repository of everything. And you're one of my occasional guests who's actually reasonably active on Twitter. 
Yes, uh, Michael M. Hughes on Twitter, Facebook, uh, very active there. So find me. Let's talk tarot. Let's talk magic. Let's talk. Let's talk anything. Brilliant. Thanks once again, Michael. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Tarot, eh? But not just tarot, the history of cartomancy, UFO encounters, hag attacks, horror fiction, and once again, some free book learning. And you can find out more about that on the Rune Soup show page. While you're there, feel free to subscribe to the blog and or the newsletter and weekly video Q&A. Talk to me about tarot on the Rune Soup Facebook page, or find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. Mm-hmm.